Hello, I'm Debbie Bell Hosking here for Finextra TV, and I'm joined by Alia Mahmoud and Ian Armstrong from Comply Advantage. We're going to be chatting about Comply Advantage's 2023 release of the research report, The State of Financial Crime. Welcome to you both. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, very happy to be here. Well, it's lovely to be here and get some insight into the research. Um, Ian, if I may start with you first, though, can you give us just a short introduction to Comply Advantage? Absolutely. So Comply Advantage is the industry's leading financial crime solution uh, powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so there's a lot of AI involved. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it really underpins the whole tool, whether it's uh, customer screening, transaction monitoring, uh, KYB, which is what we call uh, Know Your Business. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. And briefly, what's the background of the report we're about to discuss? So every year, Comply Advantage does a research report um, where we speak to C-suite executives to really get under the hood of you know what is paining them, what is keeping them up at night. And earlier this year, we're thrilled to announce that we published the State of Financial Crime Report for 2023, and it, it really lays bare um, the state of financial crime that financial institutions are facing. And in the report, um, it shows that senior compliance professionals see a correlation between economic downturns and upticks in fraud and financial crime. Is this something you've been seeing play out in recent months? And also, how are you seeing financial services firms responding to this? If I come to you, Ian. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that we picked up on in the report was that 58% of the respondents, and that's a global group of 800 senior professionals, 58% uh, re responded to say that they plan to increase their headcount um, to protect against financial crime. So that tells you something about the, in the way that the industry is planning to respond. Um, which is obviously important. People are, are the, really the lifeblood of your compliance function, uh, but it isn't enough to just throw bodies at the problem. Uh, obviously, you have to think wider about what those bodies are going to be doing, how you can make them as operationally efficient as possible. Uh, and this is where technology solutions like ours really come into play. Uh, but even before you've got to the point of thinking about technology, uh, you have to first think about uh, you know the regulatory environment you operate in, what your product set is, what who your customers are, uh, and what the risks are uh, which are presented specifically to your business model. Um, so it's really important to do that thinking up front. Once you've done that, you can start to think about how you control against those risks, how you uh, reduce that risk of uncertainty which the threat environment presents to your business, and. Uh, that's when you can start to think about how you plug technology into that control environment and uh, you know what it is and isn't possible to do and we always say about our solution it's not about getting rid of people it's about getting people working more effectively uh, more operationally effectively uh, in in the environment that they're in and we're hearing more about that, aren't we, these days, about people and technology businesses. Yes. If I can pass over to you. Yes, I, I think, Ian, you, the, the key word Ian said was uncertainty. So we've seen over the past several years, businesses and consumers be hit with that double whammy of economic instability, geopolitical instability. And fraudsters really take advantage of these situations because when you are a business and you're cash strapped or you're losing people, if we think about the pandemic where a lot of people were not able to work or they were made redundant, um, or they, you know, they were just put um, on part-time roles and reduced hours, fraudsters were taking advantage of that. But we need to think of this from the context of, as Ian said, the digital transformation that financial services are going through and the faster way payments are being settled in real time and how criminals, what we've seen this year, are really taking advantage of that digital onboarding, that automated onboarding process, which is frictionless sometimes, so using synthetic identity to open up fraudulent accounts, romance scams, we've seen a big increase in that, the, the term pig butchering has now come about, um, and not just that, but account takeovers and APP frauds, so mm. third-party frauds. Thank you, Alia, that is so interesting. And if we go even further into your research, 
What did you find about reputational damage? So reputational damage is a big risk for organizations because it can, it can impact their market share and their share price. And it can decrease the share price by up to 21%. So it's no surprise that from our report, we saw a significant volume of respondents say that they are focusing on reputational risk. And 99% said that they are actually reevaluating their risk appetites. So reputational damage is a big issue. Ian, how do you see firms balancing that need to protect their reputation, but also that desire to do more business? Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things that we talk about in this context is friction. So how much friction do you introduce? How much friction do you accept in the, in the customer journey? Uh, and there's a couple of things that I'd like to say about that. So I think firstly, friction doesn't have to be presented to the customer. The customer doesn't have to experience friction necessarily if you're treating their data very, very well. And uh, we always talk about treating data as a first class citizen. Uh, and the reason I mention this is if you have really good quality uh, data, that the minute it comes into your estate, you're, you're um, treating it um, respectfully and you, you uh, exercise what we call good data hygiene, um, you can then leverage that data um, so that the, the process of analyzing the customer, if you like, is happening sort of behind the curtain in a way that the customer doesn't really experience any friction. Uh, so so data is a really important uh, thing to be aware of if you're interested in reducing friction. Another thing that we often say is uh, friction in and of itself doesn't have to be a bad thing. Uh, so there's often this assumption that any friction experienced by the customer is, is a bad thing. Uh, and I often use this analogy of the airport. So when you go to the airport, you think about the process of getting to your gate, you go through passport control, you go through security, you have your bags x-rayed, and then you get onto the plane. Now, if you can imagine a scenario where you went to the airport and just went straight up to, to the airplane without any kind of x-ray, no passport control, uh, you just walk straight onto the plane, that wouldn't necessarily fill you with confidence about the journey that you're about to take. And I think it's the same when you're the customer of a, of a financial institution. You want to feel that they, are, um, they, they have a security perimeter which is there for, for your protection. That's a great analogy because my head is just sort of working it through how I would feel in that situation going through the airport. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's talk about fraud. I know it's one aspect of financial crime, but if I come to you earlier, yes. what can policymakers and the private sector do to combat it? Work together because fraud is a national security threat and it's projected to generate 40 billion um, in illicit funds by 2027. Policymakers, you know, we've come out with the Economic Crime Bill, which is, you know, the, the main purpose of that is to crack down on criminal activities, including fraud. However, we have seen that the online safety bill has been watered down, where organizations that are not financial institutions are not mandated to have fraud detection or provide fraud protections for their customers. And when you think of the, the way fraud trends and typologies are enacted, it's not the bank that's the first place the fraud is perpetrated, it is social media. Media. It is the, the fraudsters gaining access and tr gaining the trust of their victims through social media platforms, even dating web um, dating apps like th that are being used, and really um, coercing and emotionally getting into a victim's mind to then have them give over their money if you think about the romance scams that are happening. So there needs to be more done from a policy standpoint to bring in organizations that are not necessarily regulated or are financial services companies, but still have an important role to play to make sure that the consumers of their products are safe. If you go on an online dating app, you want to know that you're speaking to the person who they say they are. Similarly, when you think of Instagram or TikTok and the purchases you can make over Instagram and TikTok, you want to know that those businesses are legit businesses. So there, there is more that needs to be done and that push can only come from legislators, from the governments. Um, it, banks are only, uh, banks only come into play when that money is moving, when that money is going to go to a fraudster. So from a financial services perspective, there needs to be fraud detection at key touch points in a customer's journey. So not just when they open their accounts, but pre-transactional fraud detection checks 
oftentimes when you look at victims of these romance scams, they they will bypass all the confirmation of payee and you know do you know who you're sending the money to and are you comfortable that's all yes 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 i know this person i've been chatting to this person you know i'm in love with this person so it's it's only the unusual patterns then of that a customer's transaction that will alert a financial institution that perhaps they are a victim of fraud here great thank you alia and would you like to add to that ian yeah absolutely I, I i think alia just put that really well i'd like to underscore one thing in particular that she said about that if you think about the the sort of life cycle of an individual fraud that that life cycle doesn't usually begin in a in a financial services context it, it begins with a you know, a scam phone call or a text. We've all had them, you know, it begins with a, uh, a, a some kind of enticement on social media to enter into an arrangement. Um, my, my father has reliably inform, informed me that uh, back in the 80s and, and before you, you would receive letters to your home with, with kind of advanced fee uh, enticements in them. So, so there's always been that sort of use of the wider ecosystem to, to pull people into frauds. And it's only once they have been pulled in that the financial services sector is, is sort of involved in the process. So a lot of people in that sector are certainly looking at what we can loosely call big tech uh, to do more about this problem. And I think there's obviously been some resistance to that. Uh, usually it's framed in terms of we should be able to uh, issue fines and regulate those those big tech firms in this fraud space. And I, I do think that's really important. But there's even a, a softer side to it about educating the public as well. You see a lot of the big banks in this country do a lot to educate their customers and the general public about the nature of fraud, about things like romance, scams, pig butchering, all of these terms that we hear. Uh, I think it would be great to see those big technology firms do more as well to educate the public. You know, I mean, one stat that I heard recently was, we're filming this in London, uh, a phone, a mobile phone is reported stolen every six minutes in this city. And we know that a certain number of those phones are going to then be used to commit frauds. I mean, you can make contactless payments with your phone nowadays. You, you know, fraudsters can access those, uh, clean out your bank account through your mobile banking app or, or even use your device to set up an account with a different provider and essentially impersonate you purely by the fact they've got your device. I'd love to see those technology companies taking more of a principled stand uh, on, on the education front as well. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to end our discussion and that's certainly perhaps an invitation, a proposal you've set out there, Ian, and we'll watch this space. So, Ian, thank you, and Alia, thank you so thank much you. for joining us. Thank you very much for having us.